Well, you know, the thing about historians is, at first we're taught just to memorize when we're young, and then we're taught to be critical and to really pick things apart, pull them apart, um, looking for meaning. And then finally, at the very last moment, we're taught that we're actually creators, that we have to create, right? That we have to take that stuff that we've picked apart and now tell a story that has some meaning. And if we're not being meaningful for the society we live in, why are we really here? I work at the intersection of public history with classroom histories and scholarship. Um, and what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to create pasts that are authentic and usable. And by authentic, what I kind of mean is that we're looking to create pasts where if the people we're talking about were to read our narratives, they would recognize themselves within them. And by usable, I mean uh, accounts of the past that are useful and meaningful to people in society today. So most of my work is in 19th century West African history. Uh, I look at marriage, I look at slavery, but part of what I'm looking at every day is how people today use those pasts, try to understand them, um, while at the same time I'm trying to create an authentic past that people who I'm describing, who lived 200 years ago, would see as recognizable. My research informs my teaching, but my teaching also informs my research. I've written a number of books that were really answers to students' questions asked in class. Abin and the Important Men was an attempt to figure out what to do with this beautiful source. Um, and the way that I did that was to go in and sit down with my students and go over the source. And every year that I did that, more and more uh, ideas uh, collected around it, more and more ways of seeing this as a really great educational tool. Um, occurred to me, and, and my students participated in making that real. Abin and the Important Men, which started as a, a graphic novel, a comic book really, um, comes out of this document that's this really powerful document. It's the court case of a young woman in 19th century West Africa um, who essentially liberated herself from slavery and went on to prosecute her master for illegally enslaving her. And it's an intensely um, important document because it actually conveys the voice of a young enslaved African woman who argues against the judge and the lawyers and everyone in the court case as to what's really important in this experience that she had. So next Tuesday we're actually working with uh, movies. So what I want you to do when you're talking about your movie um, is to think about it as a historian. Think about what the director or filmmaker's motives might have been in using history. Um, and we'll be debating and discussing the way in which a historian should respond to a movie about a topic that they're looking at. The grandfather actually represents the Mexican Revolution. He said he fought in the Mexican Revolution uh, and like he's sick throughout the whole movie. And I think that, that kind of like plays a symbol in the movie where he's sick and like the ideals that he fought for are like dying. Movies are a way of capturing and encapsulating social meaning and social ideas about the past, but also the p filmmaker's particular vision of the world around them and what the past means. I think that the most meaningful part of my teaching has been taking students who largely see themselves as consumers of history and turning them into people who are creative and critical producers of the past. Watching them go from that consumer of history who always liked history in, in high school, always liked to read those books, always liked to watch those movies, into somebody who is empowered to critically assess other people's narratives about the past and to create them themselves, that's a beautiful thing. Let me go back and look at my notes and we can do take two. No, I'm kidding. Um, 